Glenn was a freckled face boy of seven, growing up very, very poor in the Missouri Ozarks. Some of the best times that Glenn had each day were the times that he spent at school. It was a one-room school, grades one through 12, taught by one teacher, Miss Bertha Brown. She was as faithful to the students of that school as any human beings could possibly be. Later on, Glenn says, looking back upon that experience, he recalled that she missed only one half day his whole 12 years. And that was a day when it had snowed 14 inches, was 23 degrees below zero, and she did not get there until noon. Obviously, the students did not come that day, but Glenn and the others knew the next morning that Miss Bertha Brown had made it to school because the fire in the old warm morning stove was still warm where she had stoked the fire. Glenn came from an alcoholic, dysfunctional family. There was violence. It was a bad scene. And he treasured the time that he could go to be with Miss Bertha and his school friends. But on one particular day when he was just seven, the freckle-faced little boy seemed to find not any comfort even in his school. Already beset by a dysfunctional family, he had found out just that day that his parents were divorcing and he would be raised by other relatives. After school that day, Glenn, head down, started to walk home as he always did, up the rugged path from the schoolhouse to the first passable road. And all of a sudden, he noticed that as he walked along that someone was walking with him. That someone was his teacher, Miss Bertha Brown, who took his arm, held his hand, accompanied him all the way home, and continually said to him, you can make it, Glenn. You can make it. And make it, Glenn did. Not only through 12 years of that one-room school, but through college and seminary, receiving a PhD in Greek New Testament from Southern Seminary, and then another PhD in church history from Oxford University. That young seven-year-old freckled face, young boy from a dysfunctional family was and is Dr. Glenn Henson renowned scholar not only in the states but throughout the world. But Dr. Henson says that he looks back upon that experience and it was that experience, the faithfulness and the support of Miss Bertha Brown that literally turned his life around. You see, Bertha Brown not only knew but carried out the meaning of our text for today. Bear ye one another's burdens, and in doing you fulfill the law of Christ, which is the law of love. And perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, there is no more appropriate passage for us to examine this day than this Second Corinthians passage and Galatians passage. Because in Corinthians, we're going to find out that all people, including the Apostle Paul, had burdens. In this Galatians passage, we are told by this same Paul that burdens are to be borne. And there are lots of burdens in our world today, are there not? Our friends in the South, in Mexico, had lives devastated recently by a massive earthquake. Last week, we started to pray for our friends in the Houston area along the Texas and Louisiana coast 
trying to rebuild lives from the flood and damage in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. And even today, even this day, as we meet, residents of Florida, one of our own states, are being battered by Hurricane Irma. Many have been able to evacuate, wondering what in the world will be left when they finally get to go back Bear ye one another's burdens, and in doing that, you're fulfilling the law of Christ, which is the law of love. So for just a few moments this day, as we continue this one anothering series, having looked at loving one another and supporting one another and encouraging one another and praying for one another, we examine this very appropriate one another package, bear each other's burdens. So let's look together at the reality of burdens. And then let's look at the need that we all have for burden bearers. And finally, something of the response that we can make in burden bearing. Here's the reality of burdens. We all have them. No one escapes. If you have lived upon this earth, you have borne burdens. This was true of Glenn Henson. We're going to find out it was true of the Apostle Paul. It was true of Jesus himself who bore the burden of all of us when he went to Calvary. We all have burdens, you and I. If there had been an exemption to someone not having burdens, we might argue that maybe the Apostle Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles, would have been exempt, or certainly the Lord Jesus Christ would have been exempt. But Paul tells us not only that we're to bear one another's burdens, he can say that because he had so many burdens of his own. Listen to how he describes some of these burdens, and it's found for us over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless floggings, and often near death, I ministered for Christ. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. According to the law, you could give a person 40 lashes, but if you gave one extra lash, then you, who were given the beating, would be beaten yourself. So they always gave 40 lashes, save one, just to be saved. Five times, not one time, but five times I received from the Jews, and he himself was a Jew, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, dangers from false brothers and sisters. Do you get the impression that being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ was just a little bit dangerous? If this had been you, if this had been me, we might have resigned our missionary challenge. Lord, is there anything else that I could do? In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked, and besides other things, if this were not enough, Paul said, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches that I have founded who have their own struggles. Talk about burdens. He had them, as do all of us. During the last week of his life, during the last few days of his life, Jesus Christ and his closest friends, we'll find out his burden bearers, went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed the Gethsemane prayer. He selected three of those closest followers, Peter, James, and John, to go with him deeper into the garden, and he confessed to them that his heart was troubled because of what was coming before him. He asked them to be with him, to watch and to pray. 
And it was there in that episode that he prayed fervently, throwing himself to the ground. And the Greek there reminds us that this wasn't just one time, but over and over again. Father, if it be possible for there to be any other way, let this cup, let this impending crucifixion pass from me. Anything else, God, but finally, not what I would will, but your will be done. The disciples weren't the best burden bearers. Three separate times, we're told, they, they fell asleep, but at least they were there trying to support their master. And it's interesting that after that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, the prayer of surrender, Jesus said to all those disciples, let us go, let's go together. The time for me to bear the cup is fulfilled. Even Jesus, especially Jesus, bore burdens. Back several years ago now, the mayor of Omaha, Nebraska, whose name was Mike Boyle, received some letters from some third graders in an elementary school. It seems that there was this contest, this, this essay, and the third graders at this particular school were supposed to write to the mayor suggesting ways that he might spend tax dollars more efficiently. These are third graders telling the mayor, here are some ways, mayor, you can spend tax dollars more efficiently. One pupil wrote, I would like more food invented because I almost have the same thing every day. Okay. Another third grader proposed that the city do more for old people that don't have any money. She also wrote, just a little more money, pretty please, but don't add anything else to the schools because we're tortured there enough already. Okay. But one of the favorites that the mayor received came from a little girl who said, Mayor, do you have problems? That's how she spelled problems, P-R-O-B-M-A-L-S, problems. Do you have problems, Mayor? Are there problems you can't solve? There are some for me that I can't solve around here where I live. I'm glad you are the mayor. Problems that people can't solve, you can solve them. Well, she might have had a little bit too much respect for the mayor who couldn't solve all problems. But the fact is, all of us have problems. In fact, you're sitting next to a problem this morning. And the people sitting next to you are sitting next to a problem and a burden this morning. Because all of us have burdens, ladies and gentlemen. No exceptions whatsoever. There are people, even good people, church people, all kinds of people who are burdened down today. Some have relationship problems. Marriages are strained. Relationships have been disrupted. Divorce has happened. Children have rebelled. Parenting skills seem to have gone out the window there are relationship problems and burdens today. Then there are emotional burdens. People are anxious about the storm, about the hurricane, about family and friends who evacuated and perhaps some who did not. There are emotional burdens today. People are worried about their health, about an illness, about diagnosed conditions, about medication that needs to be taken, tests that need to be run. There are emotional problems today, even grief. There are financial problems today. Even people who seem to have it all together often are pressured by debt. 
And there are many people, even while we live quite comfortably, who are within shouting distance of our church who struggle with where in the world is my next meal coming from? Lots and lots of burdens today. You're sitting by a burden. Come up here with me and you'll be standing by a burden. We all have burdens. Consequently, we all need some burden bearers. Paul not only shared with all the churches to whom he wrote, to whom he ministered, that he had burdens, we've already looked at those, but he said, we're to bear the burdens of other people. This is a one another command. It's not an option. It's not an elective. It's required course for Christianity. Bear the burdens of other people because as you do that, you're fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ. And what is that law? It's the law of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Be burden bearers, he said. Paul had many burden bearers of his own. You remember Barnabas? His name means son of encouragement. He accompanied Paul on Paul's first missionary journey, but even before that, the apostle Paul, who previously, before his conversion, had tried to attack Christians and imprison Christians, needed after his conversion to Jesus Christ to be accepted by Christians, but the church was skeptical. Can we trust this guy? And you might remember that scene in Jerusalem at the church meeting that it was Barnabas who walked to the front of the church with the Apostle Paul and said, his conversion is real. He is our brother in Christ. He bore his burden. He helped him to be accepted. Do you know anybody that needs to be accepted? Could it be that you're to be a burden bearer, a Barnabas for them? Paul also had Silas. Barnabas and Paul didn't always get along. In fact, they had one argument after the first missionary journey. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark on missionary journey number two, and Paul said, no, I don't, he left us once, and I don't know that we can really trust him, so they split. I've often said they had to be Baptist. It was kind of like multiplication by division right there. And so Barnabas and John Mark went, as far as we know, had a good ministry. Paul and Silas went on the second and third missionary journey. And you might recall that they were imprisoned in a Philippian jail. And Paul didn't have to be there alone. He was there with Silas, who helped to encourage him and comfort him, who was a burden bearer to him. You remember Lydia? She was Paul's first convert to Christianity when he preached in Philippi. She was a businesswoman, quite unique for that day, a seller of purple from Thyatira. She was wealthy. She accepted Christ as her Savior, and as part of her burden-bearing, she offered her home to Paul and Silas as a base for their operations. It was the first missionary housing that we know about. And then there were others like Timothy and Epaphroditus, burden bearers for Paul. One of the key characteristics of bearing burdens and the reason we do it is because we're all connected. When calamity and storms hit in Houston and Mexico and Florida, we're impacted too. When there is civil war in Syria and refugees flee, the world is impacted too. John Donne was exactly right when he said, no person is an island entire of itself. Every person is a piece of the main, part of the continent. 
So Dunn says to people long ago and to people today, so when tragedy happens and burdens need to be borne, even when death occurs, do not ask for whom the bell tolls. Wherever you are, whoever you are, it, it tolls for you. I love the way Frederick Bigner expresses it. He said, life is like a giant, enormous spider web. And you touch it at any place. And you send the whole thing trembling. Our world's trembling today. Storms, natural disasters, civil unrest threat of war touch it at any place and the whole thing trembles we all need some burden bearers some people who will be there for us and support us you can make it Glenn you can make it Paul we're gonna even be in Gethsemane with you Jesus someone said that perhaps the best characteristic of a burden bearer is that they are available. She was one of the most available persons I have ever known or that I continue to know. She was available to raise me and my two sisters along with her husband in a Christian home. Her name was Sybil, she is my mother. After grandchildren, she became Mama Sybil to us all. And she was available. She was available to provide for our needs, to wash our clothes, take us to the doctor, the dentist, the orthodontist, we all had crooked teeth. She was available to get us involved in extracurricular activities and how many hours did she wait because basketball practice or band practice was late she was available along with dad not only to take us to church but to be involved in the church she was the vacation bible school director back at a time when they had two week vacation bible school are you kidding me and she was involved in the women's missionary union and she was a sunday school teacher and later she served a church as a deacon because she was available she was available to me when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And when later as a teenager, I was questioning, did I know what I was doing? And it was Mama Sybil who talked to me and helped me gain confidence and reassurance in my salvation and faith. She was available when I was licensed to the ministry and when I was ordained when I held my first pastorate she was available to Deborah and me when we were married treating her not like a daughter-in-law but like a daughter and she was available on Friday and Saturday nights when we needed a respite from school and pressure to go out to her house and eat a home-cooked meal of fried chicken mashed potatoes green beans and salad and desserts and she was available for us she was available to me to type my term papers my research papers and the first draft of my PhD dissertation she was available and I just thought that's what all mothers were until I talked to friends and peers and found that all mothers weren't necessarily like that and that I was blessed to have had an available mom. In 2008, when I had my heart surgery, which was quite successful, I was able after several days in the ICU unit to go home. My heart was healed, but my sternum, which had been split open during the surgery, needed to heal. And one of the many things that the doctor told me was, you can't drive a car. That's the first time in my life since I was 16 years old that I couldn't drive a car. And 
made me realize how independent car driving can make us feel and how totally, what am I going to do, not being able to drive a car can make us feel too. So Deborah, who was available throughout the whole process, after about two weeks, we both decided, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I can't drive a car, but I'm okay. And you need to go back to school and teach kids because they need you. And so she did. So Mama Sybil, at age 79, came to stay with us, and she became my chauffeur and driver. You got to understand that seven years prior to that, she had had quintuple bypass surgery. But this was a way that she could continue to be available both to Debbie and to me, to her son, and she came. There was some place to go about every day. It was either, you know, therapy at Central Baptist Hospital or it was a doctor's appointment or I had to run to the drugstore for medication. And I can still see her and me get in the car. She barely could get her eyes over the dashboard. And I tightened my seat belt as tightly as I could. You see, my mom was still driving, but she was a careful and slow driver. So slow, well, you know. So I tightened my seat belt, had to get there some way held on to the extra door handle, and prayed like never before. A couple of days after our first driving venture, there she is, and furtively she glanced over and said, am I scaring you? (laughs) No, I lied. I lied to my mother. But she asked me again the next day, Bobby, am am I scaring you? And I said, Yes, you are scaring me, Mom. But she was careful, and we made it. And I will never forget the day that I walked in for an exam with my uh, surgeon and physician, and he said, your sternum's healed enough that you can drive. I hugged him. Thank you, sir, so much. And I got back in the car and thanked my mother and said, Mom, I'm driving from now on, and she complied. But those weeks when she came and stayed with me, and drove me, it gave us a time to, to reminisce and to catch up. We had always been close, but that time enabled us to become closer still and enabled me to realize that throughout my life, my mother had been available to me And that to me and my sisters, she was a burden bearer. There are people in your life that are burdened. And you can't help all of them, but you might be just the person to step even momentarily in their world and help bear their burden. It means to help carry their load. It might be a smile. It might be a note. It might be a handshake. It might be driving them someplace. I don't know. But I am convinced that a week does not pass when we do not encounter people who are bearing burdens and sometimes we are just the person that God might call out to step aside and walk aside. You can make it, Bob. You can make it, Paul. You can make it, Glenn. All of us have burdens. All of us need burden bearers. And the response is, we all, we all need to respond in positive ways in burden-bearing aspects ourselves. There's all kinds of ways we're going to do that, can do that. 
But as a church family, we will continue to pray congregationally and hopefully individually for people who are struggling, especially victims of storms. We will take up a special offering at the end of the service next Sunday morning. 100% of that will be channeled through Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. It will go to meet the needs both immediate and long-term. And hopefully we will all be open wherever our going takes us to be burden bearers to others. Can you imagine what might have happened to that seven-year-old, freckled face, dirt poor, discouraged little boy in the Missouri Ozarks if there hadn't been a Bertha Brown? Can you imagine what would have happened to the Apostle Paul if God had not called some partners like Silas and Barnabas to step alongside him? Can you imagine where we would be today if into our lives God had not sent some burden bearers who were available and who made a difference? Bear ye one another's burdens. And in doing so, you fulfill the law of Jesus Christ.